Today I'm with Deborah Sant. Uh, she's a co-founder of the architectural practice of DSDHA and a co-founder too of the London School of Architecture. Now, uh, Deborah, you're a designer, researcher, academic and urban planner. So I'd be really interested to hear your ideas about how we build back better as we reset our world post COVID-19. So um, you've been involved with a lot of public space projects from Broadgate to the Bloomsbury Gyratory. And the pandemic, I think, has made us realize the importance of public space, particularly for those living in dense urban environments. Now, we have been improving uh, public space for the last decade or so, but do you see that now accelerating as a result of uh, the current crisis? Oh, definitely. I think we all realise that public space is so vital to our well-being, really. I think uh, it's been interesting, hasn't it, just to see how people have craved to be outside, to be together with other people uh, and to be connected to nature. I think I think we've suddenly realised we're part of the natural environment in a way that perhaps we felt we were slightly more mediated and we were on top of the pile and everything was kind of below us and we sort of on the earth. But I think we now really see ourselves as much more integral and part of the earth and with that goes our connection to each other so definitely I think we're going to see a lot more quick public spaces appearing uh, they've appeared already out of necessity uh, you know some pavements have been getting wider to accommodate queues and and flow but you know we've seen people wanting to close down streets and create nice places to play or just be together uh, so, yeah, I really imagine it's going to change quite a lot in terms of the way that we think of it tactically. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. Just around here where I, I live, uh, quite a few community groups are now looking at how they can close off pieces of street and uh, improve public space. But then when we're looking at, at planning, how do we get that right balance uh, between density and open space uh, within our current development and planning uh, processes? where you have developers proposing on individual sites and you have uh, planning departments, often a bit short of uh, staff, actually then trying to create a wider balance across uh, places and communities. Well, I think one of the things I've really come to appreciate is um, uh, coming out of modernism and the Town and Country Planning Act and you know Ebenezer Howard and all of these uh, great kind of town planning thinkers, was you know what is the right balance of public open space uh, compared to the density of inhabitation for workers or particularly for residential that was what it was focused at and um, what they used to do up until the sort of 90s was there were these fantastic equations which said if you were in a part of the city uh, on your doorstep you would have a certain amount of space uh, which we do have now with in London with the uh, mayor's uh, you know, guidance on doorstep play etc for housing but we did have across the city an understanding that within a certain amount of time or distance from your front door or I would say now from your workplace uh, that you have you should have access to that and that went with the kind of you know liberalization of planning in London and in Britain generally and I think we really need to strategically look back at that because we've got very very dense communities uh, living with very small amounts of public space and I mean we've always done a lot of work in highly dense developments as architects and urban designers but we've always pushed the amount of public space and it's sort of been through the goodwill of our clients who understand that balance of the value equation that public space makes good development uh, but I think we now need to be more strategic that doorstep is is not enough we need to be able to walk within 10-15 minutes to a decent amount of green space and a lot of people don't have that no, good point. Um, and you did research for the 1851 uh, Commission, uh, which has funds going back to the uh, Great Exhibition of 1851. And you were looking at cycling and how people relate to each other and they behave, how they behave together. So what les lessons did you learn that are relevant as cities around the world, including London, look to transforming their streets as a result of the current crisis? Yes, well, we're all hearing now about how, uh, wait a minute, if we are going back to work, how are we going to get there? Uh, well, we probably won't find room on the bus or room on the tube because of the kind of social distancing that's going on. So TfL are expecting a huge surge in numbers. 
Uh, but lots of the boroughs are looking to do immediate works and um, we're already working with several of them and with Urban Design London, looking at taking our research, which was about how do you share space between pedestrians, vehicles and cyclists. Um, and our conclusions to that study was to use tactical urbanism to test the best solutions before you spend a lot of money on infrastructure. So that's a kind of try before you buy approach. And of course, that use of temporary barriers uh, and sort of safety, you know, using safety to establish the margins of where you want to put in infrastructure and how much space is needed is now being done on the street. And so we're helping and have been asked to show how the expedience of COVID and the social distancing can actually lead to better design. So we're not just looking at what look like temporary road works with lots of cones and barriers. We're trying to make sure that people can still cross the streets. And one of the things we really found out that was very interesting was the way in which the building against which uh, routes by cyclists and pedestrians are placed affect or kind of influence the behavior on the street. So we looked at pubs, for example, where people were spilling out. Well, now we've got queues outside buildings. Uh, we've got the kind of uh, new territories developing. And we're asking those traffic engineers to sort of peel back the layers away from the surface of the road, to look up, look out at pedestrians, but also the activities within the buildings because they come and go at different times of the year, different times of the day. Uh, you know, weekly. Um, so we're sort of looking at more temporary road closures and the whole sort of timing of public space, uh, which with new technology is much more feasible. So it's for our research. I think it's going on to a new phase and um, we're sort of implementing that kind of testing right now. That's very good. Uh, very, very good to hear that you're involved at the design stage of those, because I have to say I'm rather worried about the quality of some of these temporary spaces that I've been uh, looking at using really nasty plastic uh, temporary construction barriers, plastic tape, uh, which look pretty bad now. Within a few weeks, they're going to be uh, terrible. And, uh, you know, that's going to put people off the whole idea. Uh, is it possible to uh, design temporary installations like that, obviously fairly inexpensively, without going down the route of uh, some really untidy uh, uh, site uh, equipment that really isn't fit for purpose? Well, I mean, it's interesting. Um, another of our projects that's also to do with the 1851, we seem to have a lot of connections with that uh, amazing exhibition and exhibition road, is we're working with the Royal Albert Hall, where uh, not sponsored by COVID, but actually by an approach to using time as a way of testing public spaces. We're looking to uh, test closing the two side roads around the hall because we need it to be more safe. And as part of our work on that, we've looked at uh, embedding greenery, uh, places to gather safely uh, and that will look good against a grade one listed building. So some of that research, uh, which also came out of the 1851 Royal Commission, is now going into the cycling research. So yes, you can uh, create effects very effectively and cheaply that have a sense of permanence and a sense of beauty and connect you back to nature. Uh, and then we've also tested it in Broadgate, where over the last five years, we looked at very lightweight cheaper interventions to change the sense of what some of those more sort of civic uh, or sort of corporate spaces were so that they became more accessible and they're all movable so people go into Broadgate now and see the wealth of greenery and in fact you can get a pallet lifter and remove you know sort of relocate them depending on need so again we're going to embed that into the thinking that don't just plonk things down and walk away or put great big concrete barriers up that are really off-putting actually think about the life of the space so, um, yeah, lots to be done. Is, is that research uh, generally available? Is it something that one could send to local boroughs who are doing this sort of stuff to give them a hand? Yes, yeah, so we're working with UDL. Uh, May the 22nd, we're giving a talk for about 60 to 70 traffic engineers looking at these uh, elements. Uh, and we're hoping over that we've got a spatial intelligence group um, at our studio. And we're hoping to release that information out into the ether uh, to really promote it so that people have a kind of toolkit which builds on the cycling um, expertise that we have and the public space expertise and then the architectural expertise and actually gets gets people involved uh, and communities we hope as well to sort of take charge of what's going on because we've seen some brilliant community initiatives uh, with plants in the street but along comes the highway engineer and pushes it away and we, we really don't want that to happen we want them to work together uh, and to get that sense of partnership 
you know, and that's by sharing intelligence together. We think we can help with that. Very good. Now, you co-founded the London School of Architecture, which is a collaborative venture between academia and practice at a time when we're talking much more about collaboration. Is it a, a, a one-off or do you see it as a model for more general future of architecture education? Oh, well, I think it's um, having worked with Will Hunter, who's been the absolute spearhead of founding the school. Um, I suppose what we've discovered is by using an understanding of networks, uh, we've managed to grow a school from zero to, uh, you know, to, we've got 50 in each year. We're now bringing on board an undergraduate course, which is really close to our hearts because it's going to open up and democratise architecture for a much diverser community. Um, what we've discovered is that there are other places around Britain uh, and around the world who are watching us. Uh, so we're just in the initial stages of saying, we've always said the city is our campus. We don't have a big, heavy educational building uh, with, with vast amounts of space. We network between practices and between you know, galleries and museums and institutions. Um, why not expand it? So we're in the initial stages of doing that, looking to expand it beyond uh, London into the north of Britain to, to cities that are blessed perhaps with the kind of economic motor that uh, we find uh, in London. We're also in talks uh, with Bilbao about taking some of our work over there. And so that the replicability of it is huge, but also the fact that as an institution that was a kind of startup, we're now expanding ourselves and going into a, a sort of more mature stage of our development. And um, as a model for education, what's been so interesting is it hasn't just been about educating students, it's about learning going through your whole career. So we get practitioners coming into the school and learning uh, about some of our research projects, they get interested, they start running our research projects, those then influence their practice. And so you get this very virtuous circle, uh, we bring in the GLA, we bring in TFL, we bring in a lot of public institutions, so that the partnership and learning is is beyond the confines of a traditional school of architecture. It's like architecture is for everybody uh, and everybody has a role to play in it, even though it's uh, obviously quite a complex uh, environment to work in. I wouldn't try and make it appear too simple. No, but it's great. So you're, you're, you're going global and probably something also, like many things, accelerated by the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, Deborah Thornton, thank you very much for your uh, answers to those questions and for getting involved in the debate and uh, uh, I look forward to seeing the result of your installations in our streets over the coming months.